Hello, everyone. My name is Solomay Tibabu. I'm the host of the Going Digital Behavioral Health Tech Conference, and I'm very excited for our conversation today with Dr. Sidden of Dogwood Medical Group, which is an affiliate of Privia Health. Dr. Sidden, welcome. Please Thank introduce yourself. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Dr. Sidden. I work at a private practice at Dogwood Medical Group, and I've been practicing internal medicine, uh, primary care in the Northern Virginia area for the past almost seven years. What was the inflection point that you realized that you need some kind of behavioral health program? Sure. Um, so I don't know how many people are from Northern Virginia, but a lot of DC employers and employees, very stressful. Um, and honestly, just it just it builds up the traffic, the commutes, the work, the stress. Um, and we were overwhelmed. Um, and at a certain point, you can only do so much in a primary care world. Um, so bringing in a partner like my doula just made sense. Um, and we use them almost every day now. How does leveraging collaborative care into your practice work? What, what's been the impact of having my doula? Sure. It's just another tool for us. Um, you know, a lot of patients that we see, we can handle on our own, you know, it's, it's your, your anxiety, your depression. We can handle that. We're trained to do that. Um, it's that next step. It's that hey, this medication is not working for me. I'm not doing well. I'm in a bad head space. Um, what else, you know, patients come to us and say, what else can we do? And uh, a lot of times it was hard for us to get them into anyone else to help out. You know, the next step, a psychiatrist, a therapist. Um, in this area, it's just so populated. There's so many people and there are not enough resources. Um, so having my doula on board, it gives them, a resource. It's, hey, listen, they'll call you in the next 24, 48 hours and you have someone you can talk to. Not only that, but a psychiatrist at the other end of that is going to help direct their care and help us out. So um, it's been instrumental in, in helping out our patients. Hmm. And for those thinking about adding collaborative care to their practice, is there any predominance around the patient profile that stands out? Like what's the ideal patient profile? Yeah, for us, it really is those patients who need the next step. You know, if, if you have a patient, you can manage yourself. It's easy. Um, it's the patients who really need more and you don't have, depending on where you are, you don't have the tools to, to offer that. And it's, and it just helps having that extra kind of resource in your toolbox that you can offer it to them and say, listen, you know, there's two psychiatrists in the area, but they're not taking new patients and, they don't take your insurance or they only do cash only. If, if you need that extra step, that's, that's where joining with them really helped out. Mm -hmm. And how did the pandemic impact things? <laughs> um, it made them more interesting. I'll say that, um, you know, people really had a hard time adapting. Um, a lot of people lost their jobs and it was hard. It really was. And stress was just through the roof. People worrying about everything from the pandemic to their jobs, to their future, to their family. Um, it really helped to be able to have a resource to, to steer them to and say, listen, you know, I can be a therapist as much as I can be in a 15 minute time slot in my office or a 30 minute time slot. It's but you need to talk to someone. You need to really talk to someone and get some of these things out um, and help work with some techniques to improve your mental health space. Um, and my, my doula came through huge. COVID was hard uh, in this area, especially. So it was very beneficial for everybody. Can you walk me through how that process works? So I have a, yeah, so I have a patient who shows up who, who I know needs to have another um, hit the next step and, and, and needs more help. Um, for us, what we do is we send a consult, uh, a referral through our EMR system. It goes directly to uh, Mindula. Mindula will contact the patient usually within 24 to 48 hours through the phone. Um, they'll schedule a lengthy intake. That intake will run the gamut of their life. I mean, it, some of this stuff is pretty impressive. It's, it's, you know, going back to childhood traumas and things that I would never even thought of to talk about or ask about or had time to do. Um, and then that, that entire intake goes to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist will then come up with a diagnosis, but also come up with a game plan. And that game plan will then be sent to me. 
and then that's where I come in and, and, and I can either talk to the patient about the medications that they're going to be on or, or the medications that were recommend, recommended, help them get set up with um, psychotherapy that my doula generally recommends, but also my doula has a, a social worker on the side who will also get them set up as well. So it's kind of a catch-all. It's hard to fall through the cracks once you're in the system with them. Um, and it's worked out great because then I get to talk to the patient about things that I never would have gotten to, you know, because my doula found. What do you think's been most impactful for patients? It's access, honestly. It, it's the biggest thing in this area is just it's, you have access to somebody. Um, in, you know, DC, Northern Virginia, there just aren't that many resources for your kind of functional mental health problems. You don't have a lot of therapists that can help you out outside your working hours, right? You know, if, if you work from nine to five, a therapist might not be able to see you, but in your nine to five hours. And, and a lot of times people, especially in the government positions, they don't want to be telling their government employer they are going to go seek mental health help. There's a stigma still. Um, and so a lot of these patients don't want to say that but they can go to their car and get on the phone for 30 minutes and it helps them out. It's what they need. So um, it, it's, it's just access, honestly. And it's, a, it's such a hard, hard tool to find in this area. So I'm glad we have them. So you've alluded a bit to the impact it's had on your practice. Uh, outside of clinical impact, have you seen any other impacts? Um, it's just having it there kind of makes you always think about it. You, you know, it's top of mind for me when you start seeing patients who kind of may not otherwise register, but knowing that I have my doula there, you're more apt to ask questions. You're more apt to, to discuss things. Um, it's helped in terms of kind of looking at different ways to treat things, you know, as primary care, you kind of do what you're taught. So from residency and med school, you kind of are stuck with the same bunch of meds you always use. And now a psychiatrist is kind of coming in saying, Hey, you can use this for this. And, and it just opens up ideas and, and helps you learn. So it is worked out on, on multiple levels for us. Well, I think a lot of our audience members are intrigued by collaborative care and some are starting to get interested in, in dabbling themselves. Uh, but it'd be helpful to understand then, you know, how did you evaluate if your practice staff were ready for this type of support? For us, honestly, it was pretty easy um, just because the need was so predominant. Um, you know, we, we, my practice previously did partner with another group. We tried it. It didn't work out very well, but we knew that it was there. We knew we needed something. Um, you know, the main resource we had in the area was there was a, a psychiatric hospital and that's all we had. And, you know, if you were, it sounds terrible, but the way it is in today's day and age is that if you're not at that level where you need to be admitted to a psychiatric hospital, finding mental health can be difficult um, to get in the door. You really need to have that kind of mental break. And then once you get in the system with the hospital system, they'll then take you. And then even then it's hard because you got to have the right insurance. You got to have A, B, C, D, E. It's, it's not a great system we have. And so I don't know anyone who wouldn't need something like this if you're practicing primary care, to be honest with you. Yeah, speaking of, of primary care, as the program was designed by CMS to really help PCPs fill the gap in local access to psychiatry, can you talk a little bit about how working with a psychiatrist uh, a consulting psychiatrist has really influenced your practice? Is it different from traditional referral thinking? Very much so. Um, it has helped out tremendously. Um, traditionally, without this, this, this model in place, I would send a patient to a psychiatrist. Depending on the psychiatrist, um, at least my experience, they would be very reluctant to share their notes with you. Um, it was kind of a very tight-lipped, confidential thing. It was difficult to get records. And so I send a patient to a psychiatrist, the patient comes back with four medications that I was never discussed. You know, they were never discussed with me. Um, and the communication just wasn't there, honestly. It, it was difficult to get 
to communicate back and forth. Um, now having kind of a, I mean, they're on staff almost having a psychiatrist ready to go on staff. They're sending me notes saying, Hey, I would recommend this, but then it falls on me to talk to the patient about it. And, you know, if a patient is, is not open to trying some of the medications, we have a discussion about it and we say, listen, that's fine. You know, do the therapy. We'll try one or we'll do none or we'll see how you do and have you come back. So I feel patients trust their primary, maybe more so than a new psychiatrist. So there's much more of a back and forth discussion when I'm talking to them about it versus you go and sit in a brand new person's office, a psychiatrist. They don't really know you that well, but they're going to try to. Um, Having it come from your primary that you've been seeing for you know, six, seven years that they know you're in and out. It's, it's different. Patients are much more apt to open to you and, um, listen to you and, and maybe kind of take your, take your advice. The alternative sounds quite a bit more disjointed. Super interesting. It can be, especially, um, you know, EMRs, they just don't talk to each other. So someone could be on a different EMR system and I'm not going to see that. And then, you know, we're still using fax machines. So that's that's what we're dealing with. Speaking of EHRs, what role, if any, does data or, or data review play in patient identification, engagement, Mm -hmm. anything? Yeah. So with our EMR, you know, we're doing screenings and so you can go through and see, you know, how many patients haven't had that basic PHQ2, haven't had that basic you know, GAD7 score, you know, you can see the patients who haven't had that yet because our EM, EHR can produce those records. And so then you just put a reminder and you say, listen, next time patient's in here for whatever reason, they're here for a, a cough. If you really want to, you can ask them a quick question. And because the EHR is allowing you to have that data, it helps identify patients who otherwise might slip through the cracks. Um, so that helps out a lot. Uh, but also you can kind of track instead of rummaging through old files and papers and everything, you can, um, you know, look and say, listen, you know, here are your PHQ-9 scores for the last two years, and here's the improvement you've had, and you can talk to them about that and show them the results. Um, So you can look at that. Plus, you can also look at how well the program's working. Um, You know, today I got, you get, we get reports like once a month. Um, today I got a report of all of my patients in the program and you can see here are the patients that they see, here are the visits they've had, here's what's the program they're in, here are the improvements of their scores. You know, here's their GAD7 score from when they started here, what it is now, here's their PHQ9 when they started, here it is now. And so having that data allows us to, to not only see the patients improve, but see the utilization of the program and see the benefits of the program as well. As a collaborative care power user, could I ask if you had the opportunity to offer some feedback to help CMS improve the delivery, what is one thing you might suggest? Um, with the collaborative care, I think, it, I think it's doing well at what it's designed for. Um, I think the tricky part is the next level of that. So, um, you know, your, your schizophrenic patients are not going to benefit from a, a phone call telehealth meeting. They need a psychiatrist. Um, so we need more psychiatrists. There's no other way to say it. We need more mental health resources. Um, this is a great resource that we have. I don't believe it would be the end all be all, but it's phenomenal for what it is um, from our standpoint and it works, but it's not just my area. We, everyone knows we need more mental health in this, in this country. And, and what's stopping it is it's always financial. So Dr. Sidden, a lot of practices have been moving toward value-based care. How has access to the collaborative care programming modified your vision for moving into value-based care? Sure. Um, so value-based care programs are definitely emphasizing mental health more so than they ever have been. It's much more on the forefront. Um, and so using the value-based care system, it makes you 
hit a lot of these benchmarks. It makes you, you know, actually ask the PHQ twos, ask the PHQ nines, ask the GAD seven, screen everybody for for depression and anxiety. Um, so doing that does show more people need mental health, and then having this as your your in your back pocket allows you to you know, access allows the patient to access all these resources. So your practice has been very progressive in adopting these innovative models like collaborative care. Where do you think the future of behavioral health is going? Sure. Um, yeah, I think the future is definitely going to be involved in telehealth and telemedicine. Um, you know, access is difficult um, to begin with to get into healthcare, but now that telehealth and telemedicine is more prevalent and more acceptable, patients are, are much more open to it. Um, you know, it, it, it's definitely needs to become adopted. So you can do a lot of stuff through, through telephones and computers and zoom conferences, um, you know, mental health chief among them, you know, it, it's one thing to, to talk to someone and figure out if they're having a heart attack through a, through a zoom camera, it's difficult. Um, but to talk to someone about anxiety or depression, that's, it's what it's meant for almost. I mean, it's, it's perfect. Um, so you can do a lot of stuff with mental health through telemedicine. Um, and I think allowing that to happen with the payers um, and also patients being more apt to using it, you know, use technology, embrace technology. Um, you don't necessarily have to be in the psychiatrist's room on the couch talking your feelings out. You can do it in your car. You can do it. Um, we've had some very interesting locations with tele telemedicine the past year um, with COVID. You can do it anywhere, trust me. Um, and that, that's the future is just using your phone, using your technology. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Sidden. It's excellent seeing collaborative care in action with your practice, learning more about how you're using Mindula. Really appreciate your time and expertise today. No problem. Thank you very much.